What should we do with Pennsylvania's liquor stores? Let's talk about it next on Behind the Headlines. This is Behind the Headlines with behind the scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians. Sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to a new edition of Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenwald, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. I'm joined by my co-host, Mara. Hello, Mara, Charlie. welcome. Mara, uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been a sad, sad uh, couple weeks here. Uh, we see the passing of Margaret Thatcher. Yes. Whether you uh, were uh, one of her partisans or not, there's no denying that she made a huge impact on England, made a huge impact on the West. And you find that when uh, she came into office, there was 13% unemployment. When she left office, there was 5% unemployment. Uh, you find that she combined with Ronald Reagan, with Brian Mulroney, uh, with Helmut Kohl of Germany, and with Pope John Paul II, and helped to bring down the Soviet Union. And uh, she'll be missed. She's a remarkable woman. Yeah. And, uh, well, we have a remarkable topic we here do. to talk about in Pennsylvania. One of the topics that uh, has been uh, on the minds of people for some time. We've certainly had lots of discussion about this before. We find that the Harrisburg Patriot just a few uh, weeks ago put uh, their Sunday opinion section and they devoted uh, the bulk of it to this opinion and that is the issue of liquor privatization. And to talk about this we are fortunate to have two of the leading voices in the Commonwealth on this issue. First of all we have Wendell Young. Wendell, welcome to the, welcome to the show. Wendell, you are the president of the United Food and Commercial Workers of Pennsylvania, and That's we Thank welcome you. you. Thank you, and Charlie. And we have Thanks. Charlie Giroux. Charlie, you are the, the CEO <laughs> of Quantum, Communi Quantum Communications, based here in Harrisburg, and uh, you're also affiliated with uh, w your television show is State of the... Face the State, Face Sunday, the state. Sunday mornings. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Face the State, and it's been very successful, and uh, everyone uh, enjoys uh, watching that and getting the viewpoints from that. Well, here we're going to talk about the issue of liquor privatization. This is not a new issue to Pennsylvania. Wendell, um, how long has this been around, and uh, uh, what's your uh, quick overview of it? I'm familiar with this going back to the end of the Schapp administration. Uh, Governor Schapp, uh, for a short time, tried to push privatization. The next time was Governor Thornburg. Probably the most significant push was Governor Thornburg. Uh, closest we ever came to it, uh, again by Governor Ridge and now Governor Corbett. Uh, the issues have always been the same, a uh, bunch of vested interests, mostly retailers who want to sell the product in their stores, uh, want to dismantle the state-run liquor stores. And uh, what's always happened with this issue is it starts out as philosophy, it starts out as a boon for Pennsylvania in terms of lump sum, uh, windfall, uh, sell-off. Uh, but once it gets under the scrutiny of legislative uh, hearings, the popular press perception gets separated and facts get focused on and, and it's, it's been hard for the legislature here to sell the system because the, it really does benefit all Pennsylvanians. And that's why our governor and that's why Leader Terzai didn't want hearings in the House on this bill because they know once people start focusing on facts, it's a bad idea to sell the system. Well, Charlie, we're one of only two states that, that manages the liquor business, isn't that correct? That's cr in the way that we do, yes. In the way that we do, yes. so that's pretty extensive. Um, so tell us what, where, you, where you come from, how far back do you go with the issue? Well, I go back a good ways as well. I'm not as old as Wendell, so I don't go back to Milton Schaap's <laughs> days, but uh, I certainly was involved in the fight in the Thornburg administration, and mm -hmm. it's interesting that it is a bipartisan fight through the years. Governor Schaap began the move towards sensibility and away from the crazy system that we inherited uh, 70 years ago, you know, your little uh, tribute to Lady Thatcher, which was very appropriate, is kind of uh, on point. I mean, Margaret Thatcher took a nation that had just gone absolutely crazy with nationalization of industry, and she privatized companies from Jaguar to British Airways, public utilities all the way through, and all of a sudden, guess what? They became good, profitable companies instead of drags on the economy. And the reason that she, quote unquote, saved her country which is what her opponents are now saying, was because she took the country away from government being involved in businesses it should never have been involved in in the first place and putting the opportunities in private hands where people were able to do much better for consumers and for the economy. 
In Pennsylvania, the situation with our liquor control system is a little bit more pointed. It was, and this is hard to imagine, but it's true if you look at the history. It was created deliberately to be cumbersome, ineffective, difficult, and expensive to consumers. Now think about that. We created a system that was specifically designed to be a problem for consumers. But it and was created, Charlie, it was created by a Republican. It was created by Gifford, Gifford Pinchot. Pinchot. And he created it because he they a, sell a drug. He was against and alcohol. And he wanted to make what? He wanted to make the acquisition Very of that difficult. drug as difficult and as expensive as possible at that time. And so that's why he set up the system This was in the days following prohibition we all on know this. how that okay. experiment worked out <laughs> Gifford Pinchot was a prohibitionist so he set up this amalgam of prohibitionism and socialism it's a Byzantine absolutely archaic ridiculous model it still has a couple of defenders but most of the people of Pennsylvania gave up on it long ago both Democrats and Republicans both union households and non-union households Wendell's been telling the people of Pennsylvania this was dead on arrival but it's now moving it has already passed the house as you know there are going to be hearings in the Senate Wendell it's gonna have an opportunity to get fleshed out and then it's gonna pass well, Mr. Young, you're, uh, you're chomping at the bit here. Doesn't well, <laughs> I, I think Charlie just proved that um, he, he's not really very credible in the issue. Clearly, if he remembers what the stores were like 80 years ago, he's much older than me. Um, <laughs> he's right how this system was established uh, 80 years ago, and uh, he is right about that. But I think Governor Rendell said it best. Um, if we were building a system today, we wouldn't build it this way. The whole That's system true. of alcohol distribution, beer, wine, and spirits. Mm -hmm. But we're not. We have a system, and this is as he was governor, he explained this over and over again. We have a system that was built 80 years ago, and the reason it works for Pennsylvania is because it evolved over the years. It modernized over the years. I wrote my first paper on modernizing the state stores rather than privatizing my first year at Penn State, Ogun's campus. And the issues aren't a whole lot different today. The stores have come a long way from what Charlie just described. In fact, you can't go to another state in the nation where every store has the selection we have. You can go to resort areas and downtown business areas and other states and find really nice stores, but the other 90% of their stores don't even come close to our smallest stores here in Pennsylvania. We don't have one nuisance liquor store here in Pennsylvania. Nobody in Pennsylvania has a hard time finding a place to buy a drink. The idea that there's all this pressure to, uh, to privatize is nonsense. It's coming from a few select businesses that want to profit from it. Most people, and the polling bears this out, uh, do they prefer privatization? What they really prefer is to be able to buy beer everywhere they want because beer by multiples is the drink of choice in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. And there's really little or no pressure from regular citizens to privatize the system. In fact, the system works for all Pennsylvanians, as Governor Rendell pointed out. And as Zogby pointed out, our current budget director, and our own governor pointed out when he first got elected before his poll numbers dropped, that we draw an important source of revenue off the system. We have a balance of good selection, good jobs, good revenue, good profit with uh, control. Pennsylvania has the lowest death rate associated with alcohol consumption of any state in the nation and we've held that distinction since the government's been tracking the statistics. In terms of the current stores, they're very profitable. They're not the old counter stores that we've heard described. Selection's good. We stock 30,000 items in the warehouse. I'm rounding off 40,000 special order items. We have 80 premium collection stores. You will not find a state anywhere that has that kind of selection. And when it comes to pricing, which the folks on the other side say we're going to get better selection and pricing, if that were true, we would be buried here in, Penn, in, in Harrisburg over the last two and a half years with the studies showing the better pricing and the better selection. Fact is, every survey that's been done, including by newspapers who prefer privatization, has shown that pricing in our border states, uh, compared to border states, is better, selection is better, the only state we can't compete with is Delaware because there's no retail pricing on any consumer goods, including alcohol. Which is why when the governor announced this whole push in February from a Pittsburgh press conference, he could only talk about Delaware, why people go to Delaware. Well, they go to Delaware for everything, not just alcohol. Well, Wendell, though, I, I have to confess, I'm, I'm, not, tr I'm not taking sides here, uh, but I, this weekend I went to my local state store. The people were very kind, they were very efficient, they were very polite. Uh, but I went in with an article in hand. I had just read an article in McLean's Magazine out of Canada about a full-page article about the best new gin. It's, it won an international competition. It's the best gin in the world. It's called Ungaba. It's from the Ungaba Peninsula of Labrador. 
And I went and I asked if I could buy that in a state store. And they looked at it and they studied it and then they said, no, you can't. And I said, may I order it? And they said, well, maybe we'll get it in two years from now. And, uh, but they did tell me I could buy it in Alberta or I could buy it in Quebec. And I said, well, I'll be in Quebec sh long before the two years, so maybe I'll bring some back. But I mean, why, uh, you know, why the problem, you know, with that selection, why the problem? I love this Tasmanian beer. There's two beers out of Tasmania, the little island south of Australia. And I look on the computer and I have to go to New Jersey or New York along the seashore to buy it. Um, you know what? You know what can we do to well, the, the first of all, the, the Pennsylvania window? liquor stores do not sell beer. So to your second, no, I, 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 I know I'm going on. I'm, but, I'm making the jump the, to beer distributors. But, but, but on the gin side, um, on I know. the gin side, I, I don't know a whole lot about the product you just uh, talked about. Uh, I don't fairly know. New. I couldn't tell you, and fairly new. So I would suspect that most stores in the entire nation and the planet probably wouldn't stock it if it's fairly new and it's just getting reviewed somewhere so three that years started ca well it's so fairly new is in terms of things in retail um, you will not find every product sold everywhere Pennsylvania I just gave you the numbers on Pennsylvania the largest private wholesaler and retailer of wine spirits in the nation is Costco their total inventory list is about 400 items ours is 40,000 here's what I can say about Pennsylvania if amongst the 30,000 items we stock and the 10,000 special order items, you can't find something you're looking for, they can contact the producer or the distributor. That's what I asked them to do. Uh, um, uh, but here's the way the system works. <laughs> they can contact the producer. You can do it through the state's website. You can do it by calling the store. You can do it by visiting the store. You can call the PLCB's offices and do it. They can arrange to get you that product from anywhere on the planet as long as the producer or the distributor will ship it as long as the producer will. And and that is better than you will find. If you walk into a Rite Aid in West Virginia, one of the more recent states to privatize, they cannot do that for you. Mm -hmm. They don't even have the space to carry a fraction of the gins that we carry in Pennsylvania. So this notion that it's always better elsewhere just isn't true. And one more point to this bit about Utah being the only other state. There's close to two dozen states that control in various ways it's alcohol. Not alcohol. It's not There's close to two dozen alcohol. states that c control alcohol, alcohol, in different ways. Fifteen states, you cannot buy everything under one roof, as our governor suggests you can do everywhere but Pennsylvania and Utah. And 40 percent of America lives in those 15 states. So this idea that we're really different than everyone else is far from the truth. Okay, Charlie, you're... you're, you're well, we clearly are. Moore pointed that out at the beginning of the show. Wendell likes to fast talk through all this, but the fact of the matter is Pennsylvania and Mormon Utah are the only states in the union that do it the way we do, where the government controls both the wholesale and resale uh, wholesale and retail uh, distribution of liquor. It's a system that simply doesn't make any sense and people recognize that. And one of the facts that Wendell has a hard time coming up against is that the people of Pennsylvania for years, for decades, have said we don't want this system, we don't want state government in the booze business, we want a consumer friendly choice opportunity and modern system, you know, we hear, oh, we're going to modernize the liquor control system. Now they've had 70 years to do that, and we have what we have. People don't like it. They don't want it. And you can yell and rant all you want about what a wonderful system it is. It just falls on deaf ears because the people of Pennsylvania have seen beyond our borders, and they've seen it with their own eyes. This is an idea, of Charlie and Mara, that is not only one whose time has come, it's one that's long overdue. And thankfully now, there's actually legislative motion. That hasn't happened before. Right. A bill hasn't passed one side of the General Assembly to date. Now it has. The dynamic of this whole discussion is changing very significantly and very rapidly. There are going to be public hearings. I think the people of Pennsylvania look forward to them because ultimately what's going to happen, to the great chagrin of the special interests that oppose this, is going to be that there's going to be a privatized system in Pennsylvania that works for consumers, that's better for the taxpayers, and ultimately is a win-win-win situation. Um, let's go. Let's talk about that better for the taxpayers. One of the biggest arguments against um, selling the stores is that it is going to be a loss of revenue. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, both of you actually the two different positions on will we lose money? gain money um, in the if it is privatized what, what revenue is going to be lost Mara well that's 
So uh, <laughs> what, what I, I, is going to be so this is billion dollars, that's why I'm asking. billion dollars up front, right. which is when you amortize that over a period money. of, and you're still yeah. going to get the tax money behind that, and you're going to have the relicensure fees in addition to that. I mean, it is, again, a win-win situation. This is a well-crafted, well-put-together piece of legislation, and the numbers make sense. They work. The numbers don't work. In fact, anybody that sat through the Appropriations Committee hearing uh, that had to do the fiscal note the day the House voted mm -hmm. saw that uh, people were making numbers up out of thin air. They couldn't explain where they got their numbers from. This billion dollar issue, let's not forget that when Mike Terzai started this about two and a half years ago, he said we would get six billion dollars. Then it was four, then three billion, then two billion. And when he and the governor were talking about a year and a half ago that it would be two or three billion windfall up front, they had a study done by PFM Group, the governor's study. And in the study, it says that the cost to unwind the current system is a billion four. Now the governor's down to as little as a billion, and the people inside the House confirmed that the Appropriations Committee, it's more like 800 million, and you have a billion four in cost. So they're already in negative territory. There's not going to be a windfall up front, which is why I believe the House stripped out the, the provision from the governor's proposal to use the billion for education, because they know the money's not going to be there. Now let's talk about states that have privatized. States that started out with systems just like ours, Iowa, West Virginia, uh, and others, uh, not one of them ended up the same revenue. Don't take my word for it. Look at what uh, has been studied by the media of states like Iowa and West Virginia. Both of them lost hundreds of millions of dollars following privatization. They lost tax revenue. They lost the uh, profit that uh, went to the private sector on the product. Washington State right now, it's too early to say, but they're going to be a year this June since they privatized spirit sales. And what we already know is that prices went up, selection went down, the small mom and pops are being squeezed out of the business, and the temporary fees to guarantee uh, revenue neutrality for the state wear off after three years and it's and if you take the current revenue month to month and look at and project forward they those taxpayers will take an additional loss uh, when those fees come off so this idea that the private sector always does it better that's true they do it better they push more alcohol they sell more alcohol um, the fact that the selection is going to be better prices are going to be better the revenue is going to be there the, you hear people like Char Charlie say we believe this we believe that but where's the evidence? If you actually go and follow the evidence, it's, it tells you else. Okay. It doesn't well, just suggest, yeah, it tells you else. Now, Wendell mixes more apples and oranges to create a cornucopia than you can imagine. I mean, <laughs> the situation in Washington State, and he knows this well, he just doesn't want to tell you. The reason that there were price increases temporary, by the way, which are now coming back down, was because of a tax increase that some of our friends in the labor side love to see, a tax increase that was caused there. The fact of the matter is that in these states where Wendell will tell you everything's so awful and terrible, there's a very, very interesting phenomenon. Not one of them is saying, let's go back to a socialized state system. The ones that have gone from a government-controlled system to a, to a privately run system have stuck with it. They have not said, there has not been any great push. He'll say it's because of contributions and all this stuff that It's you know, true. Thank you for pointing it and, out. And you know, Wendell, I know that your union, doesn't, your, union, your, union, your union doesn't make any political contributions whatsoever. No, I so wouldn't I mean, say that. <laughs> so I, 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 I kind of got, got that one, too. I wouldn't say that. Okay. Well, uh, we wish that we could go on. Unfortunately, <laughs> we have finite time here in Finite Resources. Charlie's just upset we don't contribute to his friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is just, this is a glorious discussion and we want to continue it and uh, we want to have both of you back oh, we'd and love to do we'll that we'll see what happens in the senate right maura yes, all right yeah. okay thanks for having us on it's, lots, it's lots not to over come. yet it, <laughs> <lots> we'll <laughs> be right back with the second segment of behind the headlines right after this behind the headlines is brought to you as a public service by the pennsylvania business council envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities the Council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions that make the Commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals to provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Underwriters of America, a better way for truck insurance. And by Penn Waste, your best local choice for your waste removal and recycling needs. 
Hi, welcome back to the second segment of Behind the Headlines. And on this segment, Mara and I are fortunate enough to be joined by Representative Stephen Bloom. Representative, welcome to the Charlie, show. Thank you very much. Of course, Representative Bloom, you represent the 199th House District in uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. You represent Carlisle and all parts of Cumberland County. Uh, you are in your second term of office, that is correct. I believe. Okay, well. Thank you very much for coming. And there is an issue that is very much on your mind, and you think that it's pretty important in terms of improving the business climate in Pennsylvania. Do you want to share that with our sure. viewers? Sure. Our, our mom-and-pop shops, our family-owned business enterprises. Which comprise what percentage of the total economic activity they, in they Pennsylvania? They create 65% of our jobs in Pennsylvania. 65% so of all of our owned, jobs. Family-owned enterprises. And right now, they are subject to the inheritance tax, the death tax. So if a principal owner dies and they, they were hoping to transition that business down to the next generation, the next generation is faced with coming up very quickly within nine months of the date of death. Nine months. Cold hard cash to pay the Commonwealth this inheritance tax bill. What that means for most businesses because as we know in the economic climate we're in now, businesses do not have a, a lot of excess. They're, they're struggling to get by, struggling to keep their payroll, their pay, meet their payroll and keep their employees employed and provide the services they provide, they typically end up having to liquidate key productive business assets in a very fast time frame in order to get the cash together to pay the death tax bill. That ultimately either puts them at, at risk of losing the business or at, at the very least it puts them at a disadvantage because now they've taken assets out of productive service, doing what they do best, generating revenue, keeping people employed, providing products, generating long-term tax revenue and instead they're turned to cash and sent in as a payment to the, the, the bottomless pit that is the Pennsylvania Treasury and that business has now been essentially punished for its efforts to, to maintain a viable operation over the years and pass that down to the next generation. So my bill, House Bill 48, would actually exempt, exclude our family-owned businesses that are transferring assets to the next generation from the Pennsylvania death tax. Why, uh, why was this tax put in place in the first place? I mean, it to me it seems like a no-brainer that we'd repeal it, but why we, is it there? We are one of the few states that still has a, a statewide death tax. Okay. And I, I worked before I got elected to the state house. I worked as a, an estate planning attorney in the business practice. And I, I worked with clients who were uh, very eager to get out of Pennsylvania with their businesses. They were successful good. entrepreneurs, but they decided it wasn't worth staying in Pennsylvania. They wanted to relocate elsewhere, so they would not be subject to a death tax. So this death tax, while it generates some revenue from the Commonwealth in terms of, of, of the annual bottom line, really I think it ends up being a net loss because we drive away our successful entrepreneurs. We drive them to other states like Florida where there is no death tax on the, on the state level. And, and, and obviously the, the, these are savvy people. The entrepreneurs, they understand oh, yeah. uh, the consequences of what happens when you subject yourself to extra taxation. So theoretically this generates some revenue for the Commonwealth. But it's pretty nominal, though. But isn't it's, it? it's nominal, mm -hmm. and, and in the scheme of the, of the, the whole budget, it, it's very nominal. And in particular, that uh, actually uh, collected from these family owned businesses is, is very nominal in the scheme of things. It's less than $10 million a year, which is a lot of money, but it's especially a lot of money to the, the business owners, the families. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the $28 billion budget of the Commonwealth, it's a very small drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. And, and my premise is simply that if we keep these businesses viable, keep them operating efficiently, generating jobs, generating tax revenues on their own income, they'll actually generate much more of a positive impact for our state treasury than these death taxes will on a one-time basis. Right. Many mom and pop businesses are running so close to the margin. I mean, there is very little margin yeah. exactly. for error. Exactly. There's very little uh, extra cash as some of the larger businesses might have. But these smaller businesses, uh, I don't know, uh, they must, you, you must have had several uh, contact you in your constituency uh, asking you for some kind of relief. Right, and they're very excited about the prospects of, of excluding these mom and pop shops from the, the death tax because they know that means now they can continue to invest in their businesses with the realistic hope that their kids and their grandkids maybe someday can keep running those businesses, keep serving the community, and again, keep growing the jobs that the, these businesses provide. So what's the holdup? What's well, the problem actually, here? Well, <laughs> actually, we're, we're making good progress. Okay. The, the bill, uh, my legis legislation has actually already passed the House Finance Committee. Okay. It's been through, successfully got through the uh, hostile amendment process on the House floor, and it's now poised for vote on third consideration. 
I also understand that uh, Senator Pileggi over in the Senate mm -hmm. has yes. similar legislation. Uh, he shares the same objective. And so I think there's a good prospect that whether it's my bill or Senator Pileggi's bill or some hybrid that, that takes place. And I, I really honestly don't, I, I'd like no it to be my bill, but, <laughs> but if, it's some, if it's his bill or some other bill, the key is we need to keep these mom and pop shops uh, in a way where they can be profitable, sustainable, and keep growing the jobs that, that, that keep Pennsylvania going. Again, 65% of the jobs come from these mom and pop shops. So if we were to encourage our viewers who are small business owners, we'd want them to, to give contact, a call under their legislature. Contact your representative, yeah. contact your senator, and contact the governor's office as well because this is a, a, a team effort and we need mm -hmm. to, to, this wraps, this actually ties right into the, um, the governor's manufacturing council recommendations. Yes. He set up a manufacturing yeah. council and one of their key recommendations was to exempt family owned manufacturing businesses from the death tax. Yeah, and, and I expanded on that. Of, yeah, you have the support of, of the major business uh, organizations. Oh, absolutely, in the state as yes. Well on uh, this one. Numerous yeah. business organizations have stepped up yeah. in an active way to support this, this, this legislation. Okay, good. Well, we want, before we uh, let you go, we do want to um, ask you a little bit about a new book that you've published. Um, it's called They've Crossed the Line A Patriot's Guide to Religious Freedom. Yes. And uh, this is really recent, within the next last month or so. Yes, really, exactly. About a month. It, it, it came out about out. a month ago nationally. So tell us a little bit about, about your book and uh, why you wrote it and well, I'm how an, it's doing. I'm an attorney by trade, and before I, I got elected, I was, uh, again, practicing law for many years in the Carlisle area. So. Hmm. I've come to understand the threat that has been posed to our basic religious liberties in the United States. And this book is simply a way to help empower citizens to exercise their rights to uh, religious expression, religious speech under the First Amendment. It's uh, written for non-attorneys. It uses little stories and people tell me they picked it up and read half of it in one night. You know, they couldn't put it down, right. that sort of thing, because it's easy, accessible, but good information to empower folks to continue to exercise our First Amendment rights and not let the secular left kind of push those uh, yeah. off to the side or and squelch us. And you're doing something really cool. You're actually posting a, a page a day on, on Facebook, uh, on social media. There's, a, the there's book, a Facebook so. site set up for the book. Yeah. Uh, under, under the title of the book, they've crossed the line of Patriot's Guide to Religious Freedom. And uh, every day I put up a, a, so a people page from the book. So if they want to get a taste of it. And <laughs> it's a great idea. Yes. In, in yeah. the last five seconds, how did you get uh, former Senator Santorum to do the foreword? Uh, just reached out to him through some mutual acquaintances, and, and he was gracious enough to do that for us. Oh, very good. So we want to uh, thank you very much for being with us again today, and we will see you again next week on Behind the Headlines. Behind the Headlines is a production of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization helping Pennsylvania build a brighter future.